You're not just gonna come across, bro, a hundred dollars. A godly woman is known by the way she loves God and she serves others, Amen. right? It says she does not eat the bread of idleness, but she gets up early in the morning, right? Seeing she provides for her children, right? It says that her husband, they call him blessed. All right, guys, welcome back to this new video. The other video that you saw, it got cut off, but I'm gonna split it into two parts. This is the second part of this podcast. It's a completely separate video. If you haven't seen the first part, go ahead and watch the first part on this side. This is my brother, David. You haven't met him yet? Man of God, sincere. I've seen the fruit. I've seen the genuine. He's a genuine man after God's own heart. Right. So do me a favor, check out this video and then click back on this one or finish this video. And then don't forget to check out the first part. And don't forget to subscribe, hit like, leave a comment. Did this edify you? Subscribe for more content like this. Go watch my other videos also here. Uh, if you want more edification and more profound things of, of the spirit where we converse. All right, guys. Be careful not to fall into deception or even if it looks very like cleverly put, you know, because it does say in the word like people will come with you with a clever speech and they'll try to convince you with their clever words. But at the end of the day, they end up being like doctrines of devils. And how do you know if it's a doctrine of devils? If it's seductive in nature, you're like that sounds really good, man. Like, and you might fall into it ignorantly because it sounds so attractive. The Bible says, right, to stay away from people who speak with uh, swelling words, right? Yeah. So or they're like clouds, right? But they actually don't bring water, right? Yeah. So it's just empty promises. Mm. They'll say, hey, you know, come join our church. You, you'll be rich. Come join our church, right? Exactly. It, it doesn't benefit. It's, the church isn't supposed to benefit your carnal nature. It's supposed to build you up in righteous. Bro, you, per, you put it perfectly, like, spot on. Because that's like modern churches, most of them, it, it, they use the means of entertainment. We're just talking about it right now. They use the means of entertainment just to, like, lure them in, but they don't realize, or maybe they do, and they're just like, let me bring them in, and we'll take it from there. No, because if you, there's no plan to let the Holy Spirit work and the people that you're bringing in if you're trying to keep them uh with things that you feel that you're gonna have to retain them then it's that you're gonna have to retain them then it's you working out of your flesh to retain them so what you use if you use for example a means of entertainment right you put up like this uh like a, like a poppy flyer and you put up this like special day where it's like a talent show and you want to use it this is just an example right uh, but the, the whole point is for you to attract people and you're going to have to keep up putting another means of entertainment for, for retention, right? The Holy Spirit, God gave us the Holy Spirit and along with that is, is spiritual gifts, right? So when God gave us spiritual gifts for a reason, bro. He gave us spiritual gifts for your sake. Jesus said, I don't have to do this, but for your sake, I do it so that you can believe. I'm performing some of these miracles, not for my sake, but for the sake of you believing. Right, so there's supernatural power that is, that's there for demonstration. It's not for show for vain, but it's to show the believers so that they can believe. 100%, bro. Like, you know, Jesus said, unless you don't see, unless I don't do these things, right, then you won't believe. Yeah. Um, so maybe sometimes God in his omnipresence, right, in his, in, in his omni, like he's all knowing, right, maybe he will allow things to as a secondary means, right? Mm -hmm. But God always honors faith above Amen. everything. Uh, you know, God wants us coming to Him like children, right? He says, unless you become like a child, by no means will you enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because, you know, a child believes their dad. Hey, my dad will protect me. Hey, my dad wants to take care of me. My dad will feed me. My dad loves me. We were just talking about this yesterday. Like, we brought up the subject of, like, God's original design was a sincere gathering of the saints. It wasn't meant to be, oh, I'm affiliated with this ministry or I'm affiliated with that ministry. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Um, it's not that they put, like, a restriction on that, but they do, right? Even though they say they don't. You look at the fruit of it. Um, it was never supposed to be a form of separation, right? That was, that was all man-made, right? If in the church... 
yeah, in the book of Acts chapter 2, towards the bottom, it says that they all met with a sincerity, with a heart after God, right? They broke bread together. It doesn't say, you know, uh, ministries with a certain name came in alignment. No, there was a sincerity. And we mentioned it in the other video, right? Also how if we know that we believe in Jesus and we have a sincere love for Jesus on both of our of our side, right? If you have a love that is sincere for the Lord Jesus and I have a love that's sincere for the Lord Jesus automatically, right? If it's sincere, we're going we're gonna to recognize that we're on the same team. It's like, for example, if, if you if you go somewhere, like a, like a, what you call it, like a book club or something, and you find something in common, do you not like the other person right away? As a like, hey, like, me calles bien. You know what I mean? Because we have something in common. The same way, we should be even more lenient with the believer in Christ, right? But it's not just in words, but in, in fruit, right? Are they displaying the heart of God? They, if you know for sure that they're a genuine believer, how much more should we love the other believer, right? And I feel like that's been corrupted and been put into this prescription model of like, you know, you got to stay devoted to, to the ministry, um, like the, the, the brand, the name. Not the ministry of reconciliation, not the ministry of, of deliverance, not the ministry of... of um, Right, the ministry that God gives you individually, like between in the in a in a sense of you and God, stay faithful to that ministry, like like Paul told Tim Timothy in the book of Timothy. But as in like the the brand, many people have very uh, they conform to like staying faithful to the brand and not the brethren. They elevate faithfulness more to the brand, more to the name, than they do another believer. Yeah, for the I mean. For the sake of traditions or for the yeah. sake of you know we've always done things this way right yeah but uh i think jesus puts it perfectly right like you you every bad fruit has is stemming from a bad seed right so if someone's displaying like division or anger or hatred then you know it's a heart issue and if we want to be like Christ, right, then we got to be able to look past wrongs, right? Because that's the only way we're going to continue growing as Christians, as believers, right? Uh, not negating, you know, what might have happened or transpired between two people, but uh, having the spiritual maturity to for the sake of the peace of the brethren, right? Um, you know, loving people with boundaries, loving people with boundaries, protecting the the unity of the church. I think as brothers, right, in Christ, or yeah. brothers or sisters in Christ, we should always seek to outdo each other with good works, right? Mm -hmm. But with a sincerity, right? Like, uh, if you see your brother struggling, maybe he's a couple of dollars short, right, from paying rent, or he needs, his, your brother stranded on the side of the road, or your sister needs help, right, picking something up. Just little things where we can display the character of Christ, right? I think we should uh, strive for those things. Try to constantly outdo each other Amen. with kindness, with genuineness. Amen. Like it says in the book of James, what, what is the fruit of your faith in Christ that you put it perfectly? Like let's say for example, if I'm hungry and my brother David is able to, that um, has the means, right? If he can't, but it, in the book of James it says, if you have the means to do so, you know, come through for your brother. Because what's the point of me calling myself a Christian if I have the money to buy David a meal but I, I end up saying, you know what? God bless you, David. I hope that God provides for you. Meanwhile, I have the finances. I'm able to cover his meal. I'm able to buy him uh, lunch or dinner or even groceries for the week. If I'm able to do so, God has blessed me so that I can bless others. If I don't do that and I just high five him like I just did and say, God bless you, brother. Oh, uh, figure it out on your own. You know, God gave you hands. You go work and you go figure it out. You think that pleases God? You think you think that you think that Jesus would have acted in that way? You know, it's not. What would Jesus do? It's it's do as Jesus did. There's a time and place for that, 100. percent But if you feel that tug of the Lord, 100. percent to be that means of provision for the time being, then we should go ahead and follow the leading of the Spirit to be that uh, the means of provision. The yeah. whole law, right, could be summed up in two things. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Yeah. And love your neighbor as yourself, right? Uh, and God also delights in a cheerful giver, 
right? Even by doing that, you're you're upholding, you're being like Christ. Yeah. Yeah. You are filling in with your light and darkness, right? We are in a fallen world, right? We're supposed to be the the seed of perfection, the seed of heaven, right? La, la semilla, you know what I mean? Like the salt, too. yeah, salt and light of the world, right? There you go. I don't know why I used the seed, but yeah, salt and light of the world. You know, we're supposed to add flavor. We're supposed to add uh, now, not not salty. We're not saying to be salty. <laughs> you want you want to be salt and light of the world, not salty. You know, <laughs> salty can be a little bitter, but you don't want to be bitter. You want to be better, right? So we're supposed to be. Uh, God's will is for heaven to be on earth, and heaven is perfect because God is there, right? But we also have to like not fall into into the the doctrine or the or the mindset of like be just a good person and not take God into account because then it becomes vain, and you have your your mindset planted on sand. You know, because morality has to come from something. It's not just out of the goodness of your heart because no man is good, like Jesus said, only God is good. So if you think that we can be good and, and exclude God, we're gonna fall short eventually. There's no fountain. Filthy rags, bro. Yeah, filthy rags. Filthy rags. Our righteousness is like filthy rags before the Lord. Our best days, it's like filthy rags. Without Christ, it's all meaningless. And then, you know, no man can receive anything except given to him by God. Yeah. So even the, the good in us is his, is his righteousness. There's no good thing that dwells within man. Yeah. And even the movement comes from the Lord. You can't move. I've heard of many testimonies of people that have, uh, like Bill Weiss. Have you heard his testimony? I'm not familiar with it, but Louis. he was a man that, that had a very, very vivid dream that, that the Lord took him to help. So he can have a preview. And he said that he felt the torment, but he was kind of numb to it at the same time. I don't know how that works, but he was saying how when he was down there, this is a testimony. This is not the word of God. This is a testimony, right? But a lot of the testimonies of when people go to hell, they all correlate with each other, right? And people that don't know each other, they, their stories correlate. And you're like, wow, like, so I guess this is legit because this guy's saying that you don't have any movement in hell. This guy's saying that, you know, you feel this intense fear that doesn't exist on the earth, right? Um, so even movement comes from God. And since God is not in hell, right, hell is the absence of God. That is one of the attributes of hell, right? So because God is not in hell, there is no movement in hell. You're still going to have your needs. You're going to be thirsty. You're going to be hungry. You're never going to see anybody you ever knew ever again. You're going to feel fear in levels that are not that don't exist on the earth, right? Here on the earth, fear only, it caps, right? Eventually you feel uh, like a certain amount of fear, your heart gives out from panic, right? People have died of panic attacks, right? In hell, there's no cap. In hell, uh, not weeping and gnashing of teeth, you will feel things. Your conscience still still goes, but you're in a different body now. Either you're in a body fit for destruction or you're, you're in a body full of glory with the Lord, right? So. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, if you haven't repented and been born again, if you haven't come into agreement with God and forsaken your old ways of sin and transcended into the kingdom of God, right, by putting your faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone for the remission of your sins, and if you, continue, if you haven't made a conscious decision to follow Him and leave behind your own life, then sadly to say, viewer, um, th those, are, those are the requirements of God so that you can make heaven. Because by default, humans, they go to hell. And it sounds really gloomy, but according to the Word of God, that is that is the truth. And that is why we have to try so hard to push this message out. For sure, bro. You know, the wages of sin is death, right? Yeah. Um, if we received everything that we actually did, you know, none of us are worthy, right? And it's only without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. In other words, there is no forgiveness of sins, right? Yeah. So it's, it's His righteousness when we put our faith and trust in Jesus that is accredited to us because He essentially, right, swept, uh, He swapped places with us, yeah. right? And He said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You know, we were that other person. We were Barabbas, right? We, we were fully justified for hell. But then God, in His lovingness, in His kindness, right? He, he swaps places with us. And that's what you call grace. Because we don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. Nobody deserves it. Right? And that's the awesome thing about the sacrifice of Christ is that we're not only getting forgiveness of our sins, 
bro. We're getting a glorified body, and that's just one of the things. We're also getting the inheritance of Christ. A, a lot of benefits come with putting our faith in Christ, but we're not being gold diggers with God, right? That's something that God just pretty decided to give us. You know, uh, we become immortal. We don't receive. We don't have eternal life because eternal means forever existing before and after, no beginning nor nor end. That's just a trans an, an, an error in the translation, right? To English, the right term. So I've heard from 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 scholars is everlasting life because we have a beginning. Us humans have a beginning, but we we put our faith in Christ, it becomes everlasting life, meaning it doesn't end. Well, I heard this from the same scholar. He's like, well, everybody has an everlasting life. A Christian scholar, right? Believer and unbeliever, like the difference is that the unbeliever has everlasting life apart from God, and then if you and how unfortunately, sadly, it is there. But the one that puts their faith in Christ has their sins forgiven if they repent and if they follow the Lord with all their heart, right? They have everlasting life with God, right? And if God created all the emotions, bro, like the love that I feel, right? Some some love might feel euphoric. Some love might, might come in different forms of affection, right? But all good things come from God. Imagine the intensity of of that um when we get to heaven bro with the actual creator the actual emotion you know what i say that's that's <laughs> profound bro because <laughs> so i'm just like man like if i feel like this happiness and euphoria being with with a woman i love for example right just imagine how more euphoric as like an extreme joy and happiness it'll be with the lord god in heaven the creator of the emotion the one that created all good things bro in heaven we'll have an abundance of all the good things but in in the right form and in the holy form that god intended it to be not in the fallen nature of of the things that humans enjoy you know i, I just think about that all the time and i'm just like lord i like, just imagine how how joyful all feel in heaven no worries just peace but in, in in realms that just surpass human understanding our conscience transcends to a different body after we die but either in a body for condemnation or, or a glorified body like Christ Jesus. And that's it might says there'll be no more tears, no yeah. more sorrows, right? And even like the we won't remember the former things. So uh -huh. I I think you know we won't remember the hard times because right though you know we consider the pre present sufferings this moment that doesn't compare right to what awaits us, the glory that awaits us. No mind has seen, no eye has heard, no mind has. Uh, the, the mind, mind has not conceived. Yeah, you know, the mind has conceived. The things that the Lord has for those that love Him. Yeah. So it's not like, for example, compare this teaching. And I, again, I'm not trying to bash, but I'm trying to make a perspective. I'm trying to make a point of a perspective that is being preached. For example, if I say prosperity is um, a car, a Ferrari, right? Or if I say prosperity is, is a... I don't know, like a hundred thousand dollars. Your clothes, dollars. yeah. What you wear, your yeah. watch, your jewelry. Yeah, like that. That is finite. That is finite, and the the things of heaven, it's it's an abundance. Meaning, it's it's a copy. It's a paper copy. It's it's a cardboard version of the realities of heaven, right? The nicest house here is already. It's it's cardboard compared to the houses of heaven, because Jesus said He was going to go and prepare a place for us. Right, so in heaven, the streets are made of gold. So it's made of actual elements that are found here on the earth. You can't imagine the mar de cristal. The sea is made of crystals. The heavenly realms are, are a beautiful realm. I'm pretty sure if God made a rainbow. He made colors. Something there's gonna be like very, I don't know, man, like like colorful outlines. It'll just be out of this world, bro. Literally, it is out of this world. Whether it's like very, very high up or in a different dimension, I, I don't know. I don't know how that works. I don't know how Legion can fit, 1,000 demons can fit into one man. That's a mystery, bro. Everything's a shadow. Yeah. You know, everything's a shadow. So I think how we're talking about like eternal things, right? I think God, because he himself is eternal, you know, whatever he creates, it just can't cease to exist. You know what I mean? Like, it either has to spend time with the creator that it came from mm. or separation. But 
at one single point do you not stop existing like you don't just vanish or you don't just burn up right and that's the seriousness about about hell right the reality of it is it's eternal like we can't even conceive what a thousand years feels like mm -hmm. yet alone a million or 10 million right because we're confined to to time yeah and time is is something that is a reality to us but to god it's not right so it's like you feel the the pain the suffering and you feel like at one time right it's going to end but it, it just never ends yeah like human mind is in the physical realm they think about things that they are they are used to for example i think i've used this uh metaphor before for example if somebody is born in an island right they say that he was abandoned in an island and that island is all he knows he doesn't know there's a thing as universities or or buildings or or other people even or vehicles or boats planes like they have no idea what that is right they're only their mind is confined only to what they know right and that's the way it is so human beings are confined only to what they know only to what has been taught the holy spirit gives illumination to things that are not taught because he can give you previews like paul said i don't know if i was caught up in the third heaven or if i was here right so the holy spirit can 100 percent illuminate um things that are not taught you feel the lord just wanting us to branch out into something else it's gonna seem random I'll, i might cut it out but what does a godly man look for in a woman bro godly man i think <laughs> yeah. you have to look at proverbs 31 right amen you know it, it says beauty and charm is deceptive but a woman who fears the lord you know she shall be praised and she says that woman is like a gem right yeah you're not just gonna come across bro a hundred dollars you know I agree. And key word, right? Fears the Lord. Why? Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all understanding. So if a woman genuinely fears the Lord, it's almost, it's both, right? It's a reverential fear of God, of His awesomeness, of His omnipresence, omnipotent. Mm -hmm. But it's also, right? The Bible also says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Amen. Right? But a, God, a godly woman is known by the way she loves God and Amen. she serves others. Amen. Right? It says she does not eat the bread of idleness, but she gets up early in the morning. Right? Seeing she provides for her children, right? It says that her, her husband, that they call him blessed. Yeah, there's beautiful attributes that are seen outside of beauty. And right up probably what you're saying, like a godly woman is defined by, the, by her character, right? And women by default can be very vain. They can want the attention of many. Um, and this is just my, my opinion, right? Based on the Word of God, right? A, a godly woman crucifies that vanity. That vanity to want to get eyes on her, right? The woman of God catches it and says, you're going to get nailed to the cross of Christ. Like it says in Galatians chapter 5. It, say, um, it says, us that have transcended from death to life have nailed our passions to the cross. And that is one of the carnal things that women uh, deal with. Him, and we understand, we, we get that women are vain, that women do want attention. That is just the way they are. That's the way that they're wired. Some of them, I'm not saying all of them, but, but most of them do in their majority. Right? Um, that's why, you know, women in modern society, they act the way they do. They, they post the things that they post because they want attention. They say they don't want attention, but they do. Right. I'm not going to get too into detail, but women are vain. Um, but yeah, the godly woman doesn't embrace that. The godly woman puts to death the sinful nature, the, the carnal nature, that need and want for attention from others. Right, And she submits herself to the Lord, first of all, and then to her husband, going by Bible standards. Right, So that is you know, my, my perception of a godly woman, one that you know, denies herself, takes up a cross and follows Christ. Right? First of all, she is subject to Christ, right? And then the husband, right? But, the, yeah, the order is wife to man, man to Christ, right? But every human being has that, um, what do you call it? That, um, what do you call something that you're obligated to do? Servitude? No, 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 no. It's like a word that, that is like, obligation. 
to submit to the Lord. There you go. I had a little brain fog moment. So that, that's just my idea of what I think a godly woman is. And are th clothed in, in strength, right? Yep. And dignity. Mm -hmm. The strength of the Lord. And we understand that women are, are like fragile cups. Right? So we got to treat them with a fragile, with a fragileness, right? Um, as a man of God should. Right? And I'm not saying that you should like submit to a man and you know they not have their best interests at heart no mm. but you have to you have to be wise and choose a godly man but not not just because he calls himself a godly man but i mean a godly man in character does he love the lord with all his heart with all with all his mind and does his character show that he loves the lord and i'm not saying that the man has to be perfect but there's a willingness to submit to the lord right and there are men like that right and but men like that also seek women with a godly character not a woman that posts verses on instagram or facebook and then the character shows something else. They put a picture of them being at a club with a with a modest, um, with an immodest uh, form of dress, right? Um, a real godly woman, you know, is is uh, someone that crucifies the vanity, that crucifies that like desire to want to get eyes on her for for attention. You know, that's actually immoral and, and this it's dishonest in front of the, the eyes of the Lord. And you know, for any woman watcher, right? Uh, we're not like bashing on you. Yeah. Uh, definitely by honoring yourself, right? And taking those small measures yeah. to dress like more formal, right? God will send you that husband if that's your desire, right? Amen. And just know that your body is a temple of the, the Holy Spirit, right? The Lord. So if you honor God first with those things, then he'll see, right, that your dependence or your value or your worth doesn't come from anything external. And he'll, he'll give you the desires of your heart if that's what you want, right? Um, but it's just like something that we also talked about, right? It just, it takes wisdom and understanding, right? If a brother or a sister might have, you know, problems with lust or something, and then it's, it's just considerate for us to you know not be a stumbling block to that person yeah dude i love i, I told you in the other video and i'm going to tell you again right now bro i love the balance that that god uses you for bro because <laughs> i can be very direct and you show the like like you said earlier there's times to be a lion and there's times to be a lamb i love the way that you bro. put that bro i love the way that you put that you know and um cherubim truth and grace brother yeah truth, truth and, and grace, grace. Like cherubim have four faces, bro. The face of a lion, the face of a lamb, the face of, of an eagle, and the face of a man. So look how God uses different perspectives. And you know, it's more like I'm, I'm the gospel. Of, not, not me, I'm not being heretic. I just try to understand what I'm saying. As in the way of like the gospel of Matthew was very blunt and direct, right? Uh, Matthew and Luke were very blunt and direct. John was more like heartwarming. You know, I feel like we just have different perspectives and it complements each other we complement each other in that in that way and that that is an, a fruit of unity in the lord that is us being united in spirit because the holy spirit will want to show one face of god and another face of god but they're both correlating and they're both used for the, the glory these are of different god. characteristics of god uh, yeah taking the full counsel of god like the word of god says so i might come at you like very like straight ahead and it'll be like also this you know like <laughs> <laughs> but it's the full counsel of god the lord is using us both to minister to you so i really admire that bro and I, I, that's what i like about our, our friendship bro that the lord uses us in that in that in that manner right and we both go to different ministries we both serve in different ministries but you know uh like the word of god says believers you know uh jesus prayed in john 17 lord father this is jesus before the crucifixion I pray that the, the disciples that hear my message throughout all time be united as one, as you and I are one. No, bro, definitely, right? That's why, if anything, we should be quick to forgive. Yeah. Right? And love, right? Lovers, love covers a multitude of sins. Love holds no records of wrongs. And that's the hardest thing sometimes, is people feel like they're justified, but the only one who can be that righteous judge, right? Which is why God says, like, you know, they did you dirty. They did that to you. Mm -hmm. You know, even though we feel like we're justified to address the situation. Yeah. 
God says, hey, son, hey, daughter, you know, give that to me, right? You know, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Yeah. And God, in his, in his all-knowingness, right, he'll address both parties the way he seems best, right? Whether that, if he comes down a little more disciplinary or if he shows grace, right? And that's just something we can all just continue growing in, in love and grace uh, for one another. If there's one thing the, the devil would fight so hard for is to accuse us. Yeah. Right? Accuse us and have us bringing division, quarreling over, over just minuscule things, things that don't matter, right? Um, so that's just essential, right? It's essential to the, the health and the growth of, you know, friendships or... Yeah. They'll make you more equipped for what God has set you for to do. Yeah. I mean, like we talked about in the other video, again, you can watch it like right here, that God's design was unity. It was never separation. It was never, okay, you belong to this ministry, so do not associate with other ministries. Or you belong here, vice versa. Right? It was always unity. Right? The, the, the thing of like, you have to stay with the brand that God put you in, that's not scriptural. Right. Be faithful, again, like we talked about earlier, to the personal individual ministry that God gave you. So we have the ministry of, we all have the ministry of reconciliation, like the believers. We're all supposed to reconcile the world back to God through Christ. Right. But as a like, if God gave you the ministry of, of uh, uh, music or God gave you the ministry of, of preaching, right? Um, preaching the word, which, which we should all do. We're all called to make disciples. Right. Um, be faithful to that in, in a personal sense but there should be unity right the, I'm not bashing on the local church it is good we need accountability like my brother said right you do need someone that is sound biblically now do not submit to whatever uh, person that is out there first of all like we mentioned earlier run it all through the standard of the word of God because if you don't run it through the standard of the word of God there is room for deception because if you're taught wrong doctrine which is a wrong set of beliefs if you consume that without running it through the word you will let it marinate in your mind and when you read the word for yourself you're gonna have a hard time and you're gonna wrestle with it because you're just like i thought that what the pastor taught on sunday was the way that it was now it's saying that this is not the way that it is right so that's it's, it's almost bro like yeah. if you're, you're eating donuts right Andale. and you're, you're trying to get like more healthier right you're trying to well, you're going to get used to the those those quick calories, right? The instant gratification. Yeah. And whenever you try to eat healthier, well, you, you're not going to want to do that, right? So it's it's just learning how to discipline, you know, your body and um, just continuing to grow as a person in the Word of God. What you consume, not just doctrine-wise, but also music-wise, will influence you, right? That's why it's, uh, it doesn't say word for word in the Bible. But as a, as a minister of God, I wouldn't ever encourage you to listen to secular music because it, it, it is via, it throws you off the path. And you'll see like little seeds of it, of like uh, just just profane things, right? And it's something that you have to discern it for yourself spiritually, right? The, the, ask the Lord to give you that revelation and He will. He's faithful enough to give you that revelation. But just be careful what you consume, right? And uh, overall, run it by the word. Yeah, think on things that are pure, right? Like music, it pulls on your emotions, on your your feelings, right? Yeah. Uh, like you can be somewhere like out shopping or at the gym, right? And all of a sudden you hear a song that you used to and your flesh, right? It wants to like, you know, bob your head, right? You're, like you're feeling the music and stuff. And then that's when you realize like just how God can use music for worship, right? And for drawing his presence is the same way, right? You these these things can influence you. Yeah. And it always starts as that. You're like, oh why I remember when it's almost like the devil uh reels back that tape. Mm. I remember when, when you used to, you know, listen to a song and have a beer or when you used to be in these certain places. Yeah. And now all it takes, right, is us giving that thought more water, right? And then we're like, yeah, actually, I do remember. And you reopen that door again. It's a dangerous place, bro. It's a slope. You can slip and you can fall into one thing, and then you get back into the world. And uh, 
you start to like the world again. Though you shouldn't, but it's possible. People can go apostate. You're going to be on fire for the Lord, but if you make it over a period of time, if you harden your heart, you harden your mind to the voice of the Lord, over time you're going to just shut off your conscience. You're going to go against your conscience and you're not going to, you're going to become numb to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And that's a very, that's a very dangerous place to be, man. Yeah, and even even with Christian music, like there's a lot of like uh, worship bands out there, right? And I'm not saying they're not saved, and I'm not saying they're not genuine, but there's a lot of like this, like vain worship. Vain worship as in like, you know, look, look at me. You know, if it's sincere, that's good. Keep being sincere. But it's very dangerous to to not be sincere because it says in Isaiah chapter one, and this this is God giving a message to the people of of Judah, specifically to the to the to the land of Judah, right? Because they were they were doing all these pious meetings, and what does the word pious mean? Pious means like in vain, like it's it's all like this um, this thing that's basically for show, right? You're, you have, there's no sincerity behind it. Right? And God told them in Isaiah chapter 1, right, verse 12, He told them, I don't want any more of your burnt offerings or your pious meetings. You're lifting your hands, but I don't hear you because your hearts are not sincere. If you were sincere, you would turn away from the sin. Right? So, it, lifting up our hands, it's a good thing when it's sincere. Right? But God, over everything, He, does, he desires obedience, not sacrifice. So, if we... Retri he requires a truth in the inward yeah, most parts. Yeah, like... And the truth is, when you give up the sinful ways, and when you decide, you're like, God, I want to I wanna live for you. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Right? So, by default, you receive a new nature. Right? And when you receive the new nature, that's when you're truly worshiping, because you're conforming to the nature of Christ. Right? So, I can lift my hands up all I want during a, a worship session, but if I go out and I keep... And if, after I leave that session, I keep being the same person that I was, you know, without, without a desire to change, or even with a desire to change, but still putting it off. Am I really worshiping? You know, so this is more like an encouragement, like, you know, be sincere. Worship is not about music. Worship is not a genre. Worship, worship is not an emotion. Worship is when you are completely subjected to Christ. It's completely different than lifting up your hands in a song. When it's genuine and sincere and when you come out with the fruit of repentance, with the fruit of change, with the fruit of being born again, then the worship was sincere. Bro, when I got saved right away, uh, one of the first things that, that, um, that manifested was I didn't say any more bad words. You know, So for example, like there can be fruit of, of change, right? Um, if there is no fruit of change and we have to ask ourselves and examine, is my worship genuine or am I just going to... Fellowship is a good thing, right? But again, why? What, what's the point of going to, the, going to a bucket of water without just going to the cistern itself, the source mm. of the water, right? So there, every, every good thing is good, right? But what's up, how can you have something good without going directly to the source for that? Right? How can you participate? In, fellowship is good, but why do you want fellowship among other people while you're not living a devoted, devote life to the Lord? Like one-on-one. -on -one. Like, for example, if you stop going to church, how would your relationship with God look if you stop going to church? Would it change? Oh, absolutely. You know, church provides accountability to me. No, and no, no, no. But I mean, like, for example, if you base your identity off of like, oh, if I don't go to church, I don't pray. If I don't go to church, I don't like, I like, I don't know who God is anymore. Like, in a way of like, I, I mean in a context of like, because back then I had the mentality of like, if I didn't go to church, then I would forget all about God. Because the real relationship wasn't there. I meant it in that context, sorry. Mm. I didn't mean to cut you off, bro. Then that means you elevated the church, right, to something that, you yeah. know, shouldn't. And it's, it's all about just searching your heart. And, you know, God is perfect. And just letting, you know, everything else fall under the good, underneath God, right? 
uh, it's all, it always goes back to the heart. Like, why am I going to church? What's, what's my motivator to go to church? What's my motivator to, to go fellowship or to uh, conferences, right? Because the heart, bro, the heart speaks for itself. What do you th why do you think it's important for a believer to be pure, right? And, you know, separate themselves from the world? Holy Spirit, give me the words to say. I pray that you speak. Father God, put your words in my mouth, Lord, so that I can bring forth your word for your glory. Thank you, Father. Purity is important because we have to, we are obligated as Christians to conform to the image of Christ. Even if our fleshly nature is unwilling to, we have to take that and crucify it to the cross. It's not just for testimony, though uh, having a good testimony is important, right? But it's more of like God saying, be holy as I am holy. I am calling you to be a perfect, a spotless bride, not a prostitute. I'm going to go and I'm going to pick up the spotless bride that was faithful to me, right? Including the grace that God gives us when we stumble, of course. But when someone willingly sins and turns to a reprobate mind, spiritually, in the eyes of God, they're, they're, they're the harlot, they're the prostitute. They are the woman riding the beast, the, the backslidden in church. And purity is important because we, ha just as God is holy, we have to be holy. For example, we're I was just thinking about this uh, a while back. I was like, we have the mind of Christ, right? Uh, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So would the perfect, the perfect Christ, the Son of God, God in the flesh, for example, would he ever jam out to a secular song? Would he ever come into agreement with that? Would he ever come into agreement with watching a horror movie? Would he ever come into agreement with watching a, uh, a corrupt rom-com, right? One that's full of fornication, adultery. Because those are the things that are being pushed out in the media. Right? And Christians say, you can watch that. You know, all things are permissible because there's grace to cover that if you repent. But you have to repent, right? Um, but not, things, not all things are beneficial. Why are they not beneficial? Because they're going to lead you off the straight path. Would Jesus... Being the God man, the three the theanthrop theanthropos, the anthropos. I don't know how to really pronounce it. The theanthropos, the God man, the perfect one, the anointed one, the holy one of Israel, the Lion of Judah. Well, you think Hebrew would sit down and watch a filthy rom com? Absolutely not. No, Jesus sat down with sinners, right? But he always mm. left an impression on them for for them yeah. to change, right? Yeah. He never went to become like the sinner. He went in saying, I'm going as the light in darkness. Hey, for example, David, or you, David and me, Carlos, Carlos, come out of your sinful lifestyle. I'm here sinning with you because I want you to see that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Give me your hand and walk with me, and I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I will take your sins and make you red as scarlet, and I will make you white as snow. And it takes for him to give me his hand so that he can walk spiritually. So that we, we can walk in purity, right? That's, it. for example, Jesus, like, approaching the sinner, right? Shonda Rabasa. The sinner likewise can say, I am good. And Jesus, he will be persistent and he'll say, he'll, he'll say, he'll keep wooing you. And what does it mean to woo? Drawing you to him. Over and over, because that's how bad he wants you. He will keep wanting to draw you but all like the humans in their carnal nature love the things of the world more than they want to pursue the things of christ right what did it say in john 2 in john 2 jesus said the world hates me because i accuse it of doing evil there was no legitimate reason for the hatred towards jesus the world hated him for no legitimate reason no tangible reason other than jesus was accusing it of evil because of the of the fallen nature of humanity that's just what humans are they love the darkness more than the light. So purity is your conscious pursuit of wanting to follow Jesus because you want, you want to know God's heart and the Word of God. Matthew, no, yeah, it says in the Gospel of Matthew, the Beatitudes, Blessed are those that have pure heart, for they shall see God. Mm. So that's why purity is important. And oh, in the book of Revelation, it says, Those that walked blamelessly, will walk with me in white. I will, I will give, they, will, they shall walk with me in white. Oh, man. Let me pull it up. 
Uh, before I, you finish go that thought, go, 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 go. Uh, it says, Bless the man that endures temptation, for when he has been tried, right, he'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised him. And I think just, you know, to add on to what you were saying, I think love is always backed up by actions, right? Woo! Oh, love is always backed out with, with, with actions, presencia. right? <laughs> like, how can you say you love someone, Thank you, Father. but you... You know, like, let's say you're with your girl, right? Yeah. But then on the weekends, right, you have a little bit of, of something on the side. Yeah, how would you make that other person feel? Like, if I don't love them. And that is, like, fruit, then I don't love that person. That's why true, true, genuine love, yeah. right, is always backed by works. Fidelity. Right? Fidelity. Yeah, faithfulness. Faithfulness. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is a message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars. Oh, Jesus. I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God, the purity. This is Jesus speaking. Red letters, bro. Mm -hmm. That's red letters. Go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. And this is a meat and potatoes on what I'm trying to say. I just wanted to give you the context. Verse 4. Yet there are some in the church of Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil. That is the purity. They will walk with me in white. For they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. Thank you, Jesus. I feel the presence of God right now. I will never erase their names from the book of life. But I will announce before my Father and His angels that they are mine. Ah, dude, I just see Jesus like in power in the Spirit right now. I just, I just imagine Jesus like in, in His majestic glorified form. Like the all-powerful being. Glorified. Like in, in like the... In God form, bro. In God form. Like, I can't even put it into words. I just see Him right now. Like, it's all-powerful God. That's what I see in the Spirit right now. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life. But I will announce before my Father and His angels that they are mine. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He's saying to the churches. That is why purity is important. Over and over, Jesus emphasized in the book of Revelation... Those that have not soiled their clothes. This wasn't the only person. They'll say, those that are victorious, let's go to the end of chapter 2. But I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira. Revelation chapter 2, verse 24. I'm, I'm not trying to go along. I just want to make a point. But I also have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed this false teaching, deeper truths, as they call them, the deaths of Satan. Actually, so be careful with the doctrine that you listen to. Right? That's why we tell you, run it by the word of God. This is Jesus accusing a church. The one that is able to judge is finally judging. But I also have a message for you and the rest of Thyatira who have not accepted this false teaching, the different truths, which are the depths of Satan, actually. And we're only saying this, right? Because yeah, we, we love you guys, right? Yeah. It says, you know, better rebuke than a kiss from an enemy, right? Yes. So we love you and we're trying to, you know, help you on your journey and just continue establishing why Amen, you know the, these bro. are good Woo! Why these things are good bro i love the lord the way the lord uses you bro like ah oh, this, this just compliments each other bro so much it says here verse 24 I'll, i will ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly to what is to what you have until i come so it is essential for us to hold on to the real doctrine of jesus the real godly doctrine that the holy spirit inspired and not go off of something that is erroneous something that is carnal because it says right here, except that you hold, the, Jesus, red letters, Revelation chapter 2, verse 25. Except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come. Meaning, it's going to be very tempting because your flesh wants something new. Quiero algo nuevo. Quiero escuchar algo que me, que me agradece. So, <coughs> I want to listen to something that, what that apostle has to say in flashy clothes. What that prophet has to say about me getting a car. Ooh, what does he have to say? You know that becomes a form of divination when it becomes carnal. You don't want that. You want to hold on exactly to what Jesus taught to the real doctrine of God the word of God until he comes back to all who are victorious who obey me to the very end this is verse 26 
to all who are victorious, meaning there is a victory, meaning it's a race. That's why Paul told Timothy, run the race. You have to run the race without faltering. I have fought the good fight. There is no victory in something that is, that, is not a, not, that is not a race. There is no victory in something that is not a war. We are fighting against the enemy right now. And against the carnal nature and the devil. Those are the two main enemies, right? To all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end, to them I will give authority over all nations. Oh my God, thank you Jesus. They will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. The message that Jesus is giving here is very, very strong. Right? Verse 28. They will, this is what I wanted to get to. They will have the same authority I received from my Father, and I will also give them the morning star. What does that mean? The morning star is a deeper knowledge and a relationship with Jesus. It is a level of profoundness. It says here one comment... Um, uh, I read it somewhere else, but in, in one of the commentaries, it said that it, it's it's a, a more profound, and um, they were privileged to know Jesus at a at a deeper level. Right, right here it says in the commentary, in the Amplified version, in this expression designates Christ as the true Messiah. Amen. The root and the descendant of David. Here, the gift probably is the the, the morning star. Here, the gift is proud the privilege of knowing Christ at a much higher level. And it makes a reference to Philippians. Chapter 3, verse 8. Let's go there. My bad. I don't mean to be long-winded. I'm just, I feel the Holy Spirit like just speaking right now. Remember, this is Paul. He had the morning star according to Revelation chapter 2 we just read. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. But more than that, it says here, I count everything as lost and compared to the priceless privilege and supreme advantage and supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, and of growing more deeply and thoroughly acquainted with Him, a joy unequaled. For this, for his sake I have lost everything that I have and I have considered it all garbage so that I may gain Christ. Paul had the morning star which is what caused him to abandon everything from this world to follow him. I consider everything as garbage but I know Christ that euphoria I hear like Lord Jesus I know you're there. Euphoria is this extreme level of happiness. Your spirit is leaping. It is something that is discerned spiritually. I feel the presence of God so strong. It is nothing that I can prove to you physically. I cannot prove it to you physically. I cannot tell you, Brother David, this is what it is. I cannot show it to you on paper. It is something that the Holy Spirit gives you and I feel the presence of God so strong right now. Thank you, Father God. My soul worships you, Father God. Thank you. Jesus. That is worth it all. That is worth it all. This, the euphoria of knowing Christ cannot be compared with getting a new car. You can get the best car in the world and not get the keys handed to you. You can feel that sort of happiness. That is a carnal happiness. This cannot compare it to the real version. Because remember, the, the physical is, is what? A copy of the supernatural, of the spiritual. So the happiness that we feel carnally is a, is a very minimal copy of the, of the happiness in the, in, the, in the spiritual. And just imagine the amount of joy that we're going to feel with the Lord Jesus, our Creator. The euphoria when we pursue purity. We are making a decision. Lord, I consider it this the things of this world as garbage not that, not that it is garbage but it's compared to garbage in comparison to knowing Jesus and when I pursue purity it just shows in my pursuit of purity it just shows that I really do value Jesus I really do value my relationship with him I love you Jesus and I, I I'm willing to lay it all down for you and how does that manifest in the form of pursuit of purity? Those that are victorious will be will walk with me in white. <laughs> what do they say after that? Like, <laughs> you know, I have just, a verse, right? Just, just let, just let the Holy Spirit just, just minister to you, bro. You know, John fifteen, right? Five says, "I am the vine, and you are the branches." Right? The one who remains in me, and I bears much fruit. For otherwise, apart from me. That is cut off from vital union with me. I'm reading, reading from the Amplified Version. Mm -hmm. You can do nothing, right? These are things we're trying to do in our own strength, in our own might, apart from God. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown off like a broken branch and withers and dies. And they gather such branches and throw them into fire and they are burned. If you remain in me, in my words remain in you. That is, if we are vitally united and my message lives in your heart, Ask whatever you wish and it will be done. My Father is glorified and honored 
by this, when you bear much fruit and prove yourselves to be my true disciples. I have loved you just as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love and do not doubt my love for you. If you keep my commandments and obey my teaching, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in His love. I have told you these things so that my joy and delight may be in you and that your joy may be full and complete and overflowing. So even the conforming right into the image of Christ, you get this supernatural joy. It's called the joy of the Lord, right? That empowers you, that causes you to per persevere, you know, in difficult situations. Because you're not, you, you set your mind on things above, right? You're no longer looking at, you know, the world and things. You, you look at someone like Paul, right, who endured many tribulations and many sufferings. Yet if there's one thing that I think he found the key was counting it all joy when you face many trials of different kinds. And that is a joy of knowing su the Lord. Supernatural yeah. joy. Supernatural joy. The euphoria. We're not chasing an emotion, but an emotion is, is something that just that you get. It's like if I get close to uh, uh, if I get close to a candle that smells really good, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come into the proximity of the sense. The sense is the euphoria. I come into the proximity of my Creator, the Beloved, which is Jesus, El Amado, El Mero Mero, the One, the Anointed One. Your, your, your spirit just. It's going to feel a, a sense of extreme joy and happiness that is otherworldly. There is no joy here on the earth. Nothing in this world can give you the joy to the level that your spirit will feel when you see Jesus face to face. Don't let anyone downplay it. Don't let anyone say, uh, talk down on it. Don't let anyone say, you know, there's more joy in something else. That is false. The joy of knowing and coming to face to face with your creator, the one who laid down his life for you. The one who came on a rescue mission for you. When you come to the proximity of him, your spirit will, feel, will, will smell the scent and will feel euphoric. You'll just see, you, you'll, you'll leap with joy, but to level, in levels that I have no words for it. Like, there's no words in the uh, in the in the dictionary of man to describe the joy. And Paul had that. Paul had that. And I believe that there's people that have that too, that are the sons of God, that that are keep that are choosing to keep themselves pure, will receive that. The morning star. The privilege of knowing Christ at a much deeper level, at a much more profound level. You're no longer on the earth anymore. You are as a human being. But God has given you like an elevated perspective. In You see things through, through the eyes of hope. Yeah. And from a cosmic perspective. Like from the eyes of the Lord. And like, okay, in the grand scheme of things, does this matter? No. And I can give up like material things. You know, like it, you sell possessions. Maybe if your perspective is like here on the earth... Might be a big deal, like you told me earlier, you know, someone that, that loses like material things. One way that you know that they've reached of, uh, a mature state is that it doesn't phase them when they lose material things or when they have to give up material things. And I know because I know that the Lord has uh, put this in your heart. Why are people, why do they have a hard time to lift their hands at church in, in a form of sincere worship? Like, do you think it's because, you know, they're afraid of their, what their neighbor might think or... Why do you think that is? I know you noticed it in various uh, events that you probably might have gone to. I've noticed it everywhere. I mean, why, why are people afraid to let others know their love for the Lord when it's, if it's really there, right? Why are people very, uh, like, they're very like that when it comes to making their love for the Lord manifest? Why is that? I think it could be shame. Uh, shame, fear of others, right, of opinions, um, when in reality, right, what the church, what it is, is a bunch of 
broken people, right, going to serve a perfect God. Right? None, none of us are there, right? No, no one can say that they're perfect, yeah. right? So I think part of it is, is that they feel like guilty or they feel ashamed. Um, but it just goes to denying yourself, right? Like you get to the point where, you That's know, great. hey, I don't, I don't praise or I don't dance. I don't worship for you, for, the, for your approval. Like your fear of God surpasses that of the fear of men. You, you realize how intimate it is, right? You don't care who's looking at you, who's judging you. And even if they are right, then that just reveals what's really in their heart. The carnal mind. Because yeah. I've, I've been uh, to like one or two services where the Holy Spirit like manifests himself tangibly, tangibly for me and no shame like my shame goes out the window and like I just one of the ways this is why people cry when they worship it's not because they're sad because <laughs> that's a very common misconception because I, I was thinking about this the other day I'm like why do people think that Christians cry during worship well there's many reasons right some of them can come to a place of repentance and they acknowledge their sin and they're just like God how could you have been so good to me when I was very far off one two it can be the presence of the holy spirit sometimes the presence of the holy spirit is so strong tangibly that the human body doesn't know how to react except with tears because it's so strong right sometimes uh your body will go numb i've i've felt the presence of the holy spirit so strong a few times numerous times to where i'm just like it's so strong my body just starts going numb because it's a weak tent it's a weak um it's a weak vessel. It's I'm made of flesh and blood. I'm made of flesh and bone. You know, it can't uh, contain the presence of the Almighty God, the infinite Almighty God. You know what I mean? So sometimes God's like, all right, you know, uh, feel my presence. But your body might react a certain way. You might weep. It's like like a, like a side effect of feeling the presence of God is, is weeping, right? It's a, you know, physical representation of a spiritual thing happening exactly perfect words exactly and sometimes you know people are so mindful of and sometimes people are so mindful of their surroundings that they submit to the shame you know we're all human beings it could happen even to the uh the strongest christian right um but we have to make it a priority to crucify like you said that that uh that desire because it's something that is, shame is part of the Adamic nature. It's part of the sinful nature. God didn't make us to feel shame. Shame wasn't part of the original design. It you know, I just always like preaching out. the word, right? Yeah. You know, the word of God says, there is now no more condemnation or guilty sentence yeah. to those who are in Christ Jesus, mm -hmm. right? So there's no reason to feel that, right? The only person who holds you back is yourself. Uh, there was this, there's this instance, right, where Zacchaeus is uh this is in luke 19 if you guys want to follow along it says jesus entered jericho and was passing through and there was a man called zacchaeus he was a chief tax collector so this is somebody who would by natural means right be in opposition to the roman authority he would be called the traitor a superintendent to whom others reported and he was rich so he's a rich man right so zacchaeus was trying to see who jesus was i think this is uh like a short man right in the yeah. bible where he climbs a tree but could not see because of the crowd, for he was short in stature. So he ran on ahead of the crowd and climbed up in a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus reached the place, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house. So Zacchaeus hurried and came down and welcomed Jesus with joy. So there's a difference between, you know, welcoming God because God will not manifest himself, bro. We know this, right? Where he's not welcomed. You know, the, the faith of God is what attracts the anointing of God, the spirit of God. You know, because where there's people worshiping in spirit and in truth, that attracts, right? God makes the descent upon the praises of his people. Yeah. So, 
you know, God doesn't want us like putting on a mask when we're worshiping. God wants, you know, genuine worship right out of the heart. Those are the, the, the worshipers that the Father seeks. But I just like that story, right? So you see that Zacchaeus, you know, which he'd probably be hated by the people in his time. It says he welcomes joy, welcomes him with joy. And there's also another instance, right, where Jesus is invited to sit with the Pharisees, right? And there's a woman. And Jesus actually calls out the hypocrisy in them. He's like, when you guys invited me, right, you guys didn't greet me. You guys didn't, like, acknowledge me. And I'm paraphrasing, right, but it says this woman, who even though she was, like, an adulterous woman, like, she, she says she has never, she hasn't ceased to pour her love right upon me. So God is just looking for a surrendered heart. Even Jesus in his own hometown did not perform miracles, right? Not that he couldn't, but he always wanted to kick unbelief out of the room, right? Uh, that's why when he went to go raise the girl from the dead, he only took his inner circle, the three, James, John, and, and Peter. He didn't take anybody else. Could have That could have been the reason, and also, Jesus didn't do any miracles in his hometown because a prophet is not honored in his, in his own hometown because there's familiarity. They're like, oh, this is the son of Joseph. You know, like, oh, we know we know you. Really, you're God? Even his own brothers, right? Um, they, they were familiar with him. And they're like, oh, you know, why don't you go to Passover and do some miracles there? Maybe somebody will believe in you. And then it says in the later verse, his own brothers did not even believe in him. Like, he came out of an insincere heart. And Jesus knew. Right, and you read Mark 3, in the very bottom, Mark chapter 3, while he was doing miracles of healing and casting out devils, uh, his own family came, to, came for him. <laughs> and they told him, oh, disregard him, he's, he's a little out of his mind. It says that in the, in the book of Mark. You know? So, in many instances, there's, there's unbelief, right? And sometimes God will not work or move supernaturally where there is no trust in him. Right? Sometimes God will make a miracle happen so that they can believe for your sake. It's, it's all at the discretion of God at the end of the day. There's no set formula um, to say, oh, you know, if you do this, God will show up. Or if you don't do this, God will show up. Right? He just wants a sincere heart at the end of the day. That's what it is. It's the faith, bro. Like it's going back to the Roman centurion, right? It says he was marveled. Two instances, right? He's marveled at his faith. Amen. And he was also marveled at the unbelief with, in his own hometown. And Jesus always says, Blessed are those who believe yet have not seen. Yes. But he says, Lord, I'm a man of authority, of order. Just how Jesus himself is, right? Amen. He's like, Lord, just send your word out. And his word always goes forth, right, to accomplish everything he set it out to do. So it says that centurion, right, that soldier, Roman soldier, he goes back. And he gets report that at the very time that the word came out of the very word himself, he was, God sent, out, sent it out and he was healed at that instant moment. It's the faith. God honors faith. Let me tell you a story. Like a while back, I had pain in, in my rib, a really bad pain. And I had just read it. I had just read that, uh, that story of the Roman centurion. I kid you not, dude. Like... With that story in mind, the faith of the centurion, how he believed that the word of Jesus, I prayed over my rib and I had that same faith in mind, bro. And that pain went away within a minute. It went away and it was there for a while, bro. Like I couldn't sleep and it was, it was a lot of pain. It was random. I don't know why I felt like a random pain in my rib. And then I'm like, in the name of Jesus, heal. Within the minute of it hurting for a while, it just went away. The same thing with like a sharp pain in my eye. I think I had like, uh, Something fell into my eye, right? And like for like 10 minutes straight, I was trying to get it out because it stung. Like really, really bad, bro. Like, like soap in your eye level, like of a sting. And I was just like, I was wincing in pain. And I covered my eye and I prayed for it. Within a minute, bro, the pain just, I remember, started going down, down. And I was mindful of that story. And I was like, Lord, just like you healed the servant of the centurion by your word. I pray for my eye. I don't remember exactly. I don't remember exactly what I said word for word, but I just remember that I, I have my trust in His word. And within a minute, bro, thirty seconds—not even a minute—within thirty seconds, the pain just 
decreased, 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 decreased. And it went away. It's a big deal for me. That, that's, why, that's, that's why that's why it's very important, right? Who we surround ourselves with. Yeah. You know, you know, faith is is the assurance of the reality of things not seen. Yeah. But faith is is actual substance, right? It, it's it's something that hasn't it's a spiritual thing that hasn't materialized to the physical yet. So we should have we should surround ourselves with people, right? Because there's power in unity. Yeah. You should have those friends. Hey, you're believing for this? Okay, man. Like, hey, brother, I'll, I'll support you on that. You know, where two or more are gathered, you know, if two or more come into agreement on anything, then it shall be done according to your faith so that the Father is glorified. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so remove, you know, faith will tell you there's no logical reason for me yeah. to believe that this is even possible. But you know what? I believe for the poss- impossible. Because I know you can. Because he can. Yeah. He's in both realities, bro. So he's like, I can literally take someone else from my my realm if they pass away and put him back into your realm. He has the power to do that. He can like stick out his hand and his hand be in heaven and then bring it back and it be in the earth. He can do that, bro. He's an interdimensional. He's everywhere, bro. He's omniscient, bro. That's, that's pretty insane. A good illustration of that, right, is you have Jesus leaving one of the towns, right? And there's this blind man. Who his whole identity, he'd be known as the blind man, right? And he has the faith. He sees the word passing, right? And his, in his desperation, right? With genuineness, it's the faith that attracts God. He's saying, Jesus, son of David. And they're like, bro, bro, just shut up. Like, shut up, right? Yeah. He's saying, Jesus, son of David. He was willing he was willing, right? And then says Jesus, he says, go and call that man, right? So he, he's brought to him. He's like, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, restore, if you're willing, restore my sight. I'm willing. You know, that's just one instance, right? About how, how the faith attracts God. Or there's, a, there's another instance, right? Where uh, they, the disciples asked, Lord, you know, what sin did this man do? that caused them to be born this way. Mm-hmm. So God the Father was would already have appointed that person, right, to be healed. And Jesus was just, because he's confined to time, right, when he was he came as a servant, he would be walking into that. And he says none. But so that his Father may be glorified. So that's why there is some things, right, that God, I don't know this if this might be a word for one of you guys, but... If there's things that God wants to do in your life, right? It's not that He's not willing. He is willing, right? Because all His promises, they're yes and amen over your life. And it's just faith sometimes will cause you to do rational things, right? Abraham, by faith, he was called to a land that he didn't know was his, right? And because he had that faith, that faith was credited to him as the righteousness of God. So don't let anyone, you know, Jesus said, your first enemies will be those of your household. Why? Because like my brother was saying, there's familiarity, right? Well, this is, this is Carlos or this is David. You know, I've grown up with him. I knew him in high school. or I knew him, who he was at that moment in college, right? But God's thoughts are not our thoughts. God's ways are not our ways. So he's always willing. And even if you don't have, if you struggle with faith, right, God gives to each person a measure of faith. You can ask the Lord graciously, Lord, help my unbelief. Right? I believe, but Lord, help my unbelief. So don't ever let anyone quench your faith, right? Believe for the impossible. Because Jesus says, miracle signs and wonders will follow those that believe. You bring up an excellent point. I think a lot of Christians have made the great mistake of pursuing miracle and signs and wonders when Jesus said at the end of John in chapter 17 is in John 17 let me pull it up no Mark 16 uh-huh. these signs shall follow them that believe in my name they shall cast out demons right that the, the whole chapter of Mark 16 the bottom the towards the end many believers make the mistake Christians of pursuing all that Right. 
it doesn't say believers pursue these things shall follow no it says these things shall follow not vice versa right what we should pursue is the spiritual gifts pursue the spiritual gifts the gift of prophecy the gift of discernment of spirits uh the the gifts of the spirit right we should pursue that but that the miracle signs and wonders are not to be pursued they are a fruit of a believer right i cannot tell you how many times that i've had supernatural experiences that i never sought out god just allowed them to happen just to strengthen my faith i didn't look for it god just gave me those experiences and that gave me a more profound love for the lord because i'm just like god wow like you actually you came through <laughs> in a way that i'm like man like this 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 is possible my man's standards you know, they can't warp the reality to be what it is you know what i mean that's how you know god is so faithful man yeah. like he right he says he leads you to a path of righteousness for for your his name's sake right so i like saying those are times where god you know puts his fingerprint in your path yeah so it, it right gives on. you just enough faith right to to spur you on to to keep believing for more right and then you know because you saw the fingerprint you know that the divine sovereign hand of the Lord is guiding you. Yeah. He, will, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. He is the author and the finisher yeah, of your faith. faith. It's like, I don't mean it to sound like demeaning. I hope you might not take it. Do not take it as in a way of demeaning. But it's like someone leaving like cookie crumbs for you. And I'm just like... <laughs> Think of it like a, like a faith of a child. <laughs> it's gonna, the carnal man cannot receive the things of God. It says on the word of God. The carnal man cannot please God. Because the things of God are foolishness to the carnal man. But what does the word of God say also? That God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. Right? Amen. So the, the language that we're using, is it, it's only spiritually discerned by the spiritual. If you're carnal, sorry to tell you, but a, a fruit of your carnality is that you're mocking this kind of language. You think it's foolish. That is a sign that you're carnal. And that is a sign that you need to get in with the Lord and turn away from that. Because eventually that carnality will eat you up. So if you find if you find this to be ridiculous speech, you're mocking, or you're mocking it, right? It's a sign that you're carnal. You might be lukewarm. I'm not saying you are, I'm just saying you might be, right? But and only only because we, we can come from a place, right? Where yeah. we, we've tasted. We've been in that. We've tasted the yeah. goodness of the Lord, right? So it's... Yeah. it's it's almost like to not express it would be to try to quench that. Yeah. You know, it's just an expression. Yeah. It's an expression and we should not quench the fire of the Holy Spirit at all. Right? We shouldn't, uh, if you feel the Holy Spirit like descend upon you, right? Do not quench it. Do not, Him. He does get grieved. And if you quench the Holy Spirit too much, he might not manifest tangibly until you're sincere about seeking him again. But there are times where he will draw you to himself. Right? So it's having that faith of a child. Because if you have the faith of a child, you're 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 willing to receive God's way of communication. Let's put it right in terms of knowledge, right? There yeah. was this great man, Nicodemus. Okay. Right? Perfect. This theologian. He would be well versed in the scriptures. Amen. He says, unless you are born again, by no means will you enter the kingdom of heaven. And even somebody, right, like you said, he uses the foolish things. He says, you know, how can I be born again, right? Do I have to enter my, my mother's womb? Mm. He says, you're, you're the greatest teachers of all of Israel, yet you don't know this? Mm. If I tell you, you know, earthly things, then how will you have the faith to understand heavenly things? Because, there, let me pull that verse, right? Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so it's 1 Corinthians uh, 19, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 19. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with mm -hmm. God. There's a worldly wisdom, right? Um, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. So it says, right, this passage says that God chose the foolish things, like how I'm part of what you're saying, you know, the world to shame the wise. So that's why we need the Holy Spirit. That's why we need discernment. That was 1 Corinthians uh, 1, 25, for Amen. any of those who are curious. Amen. Amen. Like right on part of what you're saying, bro, I've had conversations with professionals, like professionals of society, bro, right? And 
these conversations are real, bro. Like, if you talk to them, people that grew up in Catholicism or, or even in a Christian household, right? And then they, they went to college. Like, they were educated in the ways of the world. They were educated intellectually, obviously. They got to a very high um, a status in life, right? You know, uh, professional people, businessmen, uh, doctors, all, all kinds of people, right? And they they sincerely think that the way that God speaks to His people is, is foolish, bro. You can explain to them the like a profound mystery. They will laugh it off, bro. They will laugh it off. And, and you can tell them the most, like, you can slice them in the flesh with a word. And even prophetically. Some of them have their minds already made up. They've already hit the state of reprobate. Unfortunately, but those conversations are legitimate. And what you were saying earlier about faith being the uh, believing in something that you have not yet seen. Um, there are people that I've been seeing online, and I'm not saying they're false at all. Do not take this as, as like a like a bash on them. I I admire what what it seems that they're doing. I don't know them. I don't know them at all, but I like I'm I'm weighing it by the word of God and by what my brother just read in the in the essence of faith of what it really is. It's putting your trust in things you don't you have not yet seen. Jesus said, like you said, blessed is he that has not seen yet believes. Right? There are people that that, uh, that while they're preaching they say, Why do I believe God? Because the evidence points to him. If you know who I'm talking about, you know, I'm not gonna name drop because you know I admire what they're doing. Um, but it's uh, biblically speaking, we shouldn't put our faith in evidence, as in like they, they say the evidence is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as being historical artifacts. Amen. Yeah, they are historical artifacts. But what God has always wanted since the time of Abraham was, and it's gonna sound foolish to the carnal mind, but has been faith in Him. Take His word for it. Right? Faith is the evidence. Of putting your trust in what you have not seen and Jesus reinforced it when he said blessed is he for one blessed is he that is not offended by me and then blessed is he that ha that believes and has not yet seen right so that's a little bit of like it's a little skewed I get what they're saying and yeah sure they have a point but if you want to get to the meat and potatoes of the heart of God the heart of God has always desired trust in what you do not see as in him and him alone I'm not saying trust in what you do not see new age or whatever other garbage Right, el Señor lo reprenda. But as in, in the Lord, in Jesus Himself, the way, the truth, and the life. Think about the Pharisees, right? Like they were seeing miracles and they were accusing Jesus of casting out demons by Beelzebub, right? So they were already seeing the actual hand of yeah. God because Jesus is the Godhead bodily. He yeah. is God. If you see Him, you see the Father, right? And Jesus, with unbelief, it just, there's never a limit to it. Right? It's like a wicked generation demands a sign, mm. but none will be given mm. except the sign of Jonah. So what's the sign of Jonah, right? Just how like the Jonah was in the belly of the well three days and three nights. So was Jesus, right? When he was buried, he was in the tomb for three days. He took the keys of the enemy and then I mean, to maybe the people he was talking to, right? Maybe they would have now, like, believed him because maybe they, they would have, like, seen him now. Yeah. But it took them having to crucify him first to only then, right, actually see. He graciously, God's still showing that he is who he says he is. And just like I'm part of what you're saying also, like, one can argue, well, what about Thomas? You know, he... he demanded a sign and Jesus gave him a sign a few days later he appeared and he said look at my scars like look at the nails that were no look at where the nails were in my hand and Thomas put his finger through Jesus's hand and he realized that it's Jesus one can argue why did they have tangible evidence and us in this current uh, generation we have to we have oh, just a book right my answer to that is if you ask the Lord to reveal Himself to you, He will in a way that you might recognize Him. 
I hope he does in a way that you might recognize him. For sure, bro. Like, yeah. draw near to God and he will draw he'll near draw to you, right? Yeah. Um, now, we're not getting after anybody, right? No, if, not at all. If you need signs or you need God to reinforce your belief in him, right? I always tell people, you know, if you need actual evidence or you need to go about it uh, through a more theological or you need, you know, evidence supporting. There's many supporting evidence of Christ resurrecting of the if you look up there is an actual earthquake you can look this up bro on NASA right of an earthquake happening on April 3rd you know 33 AD mm -hmm. so the evidence is there right I think God is okay. graciously showing things to people but cookie um, crumbs just cookie crumbs right just I for the sake of you know God wishes that no one would perish but that all would come to the understanding right of who Jesus is uh, and Jesus doesn't reprimand unbelief. You see, you know, Peter, right? Who's He's the only one, the only radical enough one to actually, for one, he doubts God, right? He says, Lord, if it is really you, the word is sent out to him, right? Command me to come to you. And he, so he questions God, that the word, right? And for those few moments, three seconds, we don't know what it is, right? But he walked on water as long as he was looking towards God. God supernaturally sustained him. You know, he was in the midst of the Creator himself. But as soon as his eyes were taken off of God, right, he began to sink. Listen to that. And, and then the Lord, right, graciously, lovingly, he's like, oh, you have little faith. Like, why did you doubt? Right, kind of like he had fell and he's, he's dusting off his son, like, like, oh, why don't you trust me? You know, like at that point, he was already like, it was a little frustrated, but he also recognized, he's like, oh, I understand you're human, but I've already shown you enough so that you might believe. So he is both sides of the coin. Like he understands, but at the same time, he wants us to trust him. And going back to the earthquake, bro, like one of the things that we were talking about the other day, I don't know if you remember about the earthquake, how the earthquake was earth way of groaning that their creator that their creator was taken that he was crucified as I say my king that's why the earth shook it rick a rock shaking at the death of its creator right because all things are made by him oh, for him through him That's why demons would have known, right? Have you come to appoint us, you know, torture us before the appointed time? But it says that all creation, right, is groaning until the, the revelation of Christ. And the sons of God are made manifest. So creation acknowledges its creator. If a rock that doesn't have a human mind quakes at the death of God in the flesh how dumb is it for someone to say there is no God the only species known to man to deny God bro even the animals know that there's a God like how do, how do animals know right how to migrate yeah. or when a storm's coming right they often know yeah. they fly away they fly away they, they leave they know there's danger coming in the same way, that is why we might preach a little too blunt because we're giving you a forecast of biblical prophecy. Right? You want to avoid all that. The way to avoid all that, all the doom, it is going to be doomed to put it to you uh, direct. You know, you got to repent of your sins, be born again, put your faith in Christ and walk it out with a sincerity. Likewise, God knows when you're not being sincere. So we have to be careful on how we're walking and what, what level of sincerity we're walking the walk. In the same manner, we have, we, we have been given a, a book and that is God's grace also. You know, we're, we were given a book that lets us know what God sounds like. And we still want to hear from, yes, God appointed leaders so that we can have something to relate to, you know, human to human. You know, it's good that my brother David's like giving me word also because I'm able to relate to my brother David. Right, God is so good that He gives me a human being to relay the Word of God for me. Right, but we're saying because we live in a fallen state of the world, 
that we cannot put off reading the Word of God for ourselves because we have to read the Word of God if we want a more clear understanding of what God sounds like. Right? So, do not neglect reading your Word. Put it as a top priority. Uh, Ray Comfort puts it this way. He's an evangelist that says, uh, no Bible, no breakfast. No read, no feed. 